A pleasant Sabbath to everybody. Welcome. Welcome. So we're, we're actually continuing from last Sabbath. Last Sabbath we looked at the origin of evil. And there's a question that remains. Why did God permit it? Why was sin permitted? So I want to invite you to pray with me even before we begin the study. I ask the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts and help us to see God's love in all of this. Let us pray. And so, Father in heaven, we are grateful. We are thankful for infinite love. And oh, Father, even sometimes we look at the cross and yet we are unable to grasp it fully. But grant, Lord, that your spirit will so work on our minds and our hearts that we can see glimpses of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Bless your word to every heart this morning. Give us hearts that will receive and apply these words to our lives so that we have a conversion and a transformational experience. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, question, why was sin permitted? We looked at some of this in our last study, but let us see what the Bible says. Let's see what the Bible says about sin. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel 28, verse 17, speaking of Lucifer, this is this descent into sin. This is how Lucifer sin. Motive. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. The Bible says. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee, lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now all of this seems as arbitrary the word of God. Until we read where the word of God tells me is that pride dwelt before a fall. Thine heart was lifted up. This is pride. Because of thy beauty. So Lucifer succumbed to the laws of life. If you lift yourself up, he that exalted himself, the Bible says, shall be what? Abased. He succumbed to law. So by looking away from God and contemplating self, Lucifer began his descent into sin. Fall. So we looked at Proverbs 16, 8 already, 18, pride good before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Luke 14, 11, he that exalted, sorry, himself shall be abased. But he that humbled himself, there's another thought, there's another law that Christ obeyed. He humbled himself, and now he is highly exalted. Praise the Lord. So it is, for, it is law. It is law. So in our last study, we saw that sin is inexcusable. To excuse sin would be to defend sin. We saw that last Sabbath. And we also saw that no reason can be given for the existence of sin. It's a mysterious thing. It's mysterious. But it begins in the heart because God has given something called freedom of choice. We are told in the book Prophets and Kings, Page 510, paragraph 4. It says, God never compels the obedience of man. Never. He leaves all free to choose whom they will serve. Freedom of choice. 
Now, freedom of choice is very important to God. We're told in this verse, 759, paragraph 1, it says, compelling power is found only under Satan's government. So God does not compel the conscience. He does not force the choice. He does not decide for us. We make our own choices. Every creature that God has made has that freedom to exercise choice. Let's look at the atmosphere in heaven before sin entered. The Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy says, I'm reading Great Controversy 493, paragraph 1. It says, Before the entrance of evil, there was peace and joy throughout the universe. All was in perfect harmony with the Creator's will. Love for God was supreme. Love for one another impartial. So love pervaded heaven before sin entered. Paragraph 2 says, God desires from all his creatures the service of love. But service of love has to coincide with freedom of choice. If I am to serve you, if I am to serve God from love, I must have the choice, freedom of choice. Because I must make a choice to serve, to love. Love requires choice. So we can love one person and don't love another. All right? But we have to have choice to do that. And because God can only be served from love, therefore choice had to be given. God desires from all his creatures, therefore, the service of love. Homage that springs from an intelligent appreciation of his character. In other words, we must appreciate the character of the other before we can love them. A husband must appreciate the character of the wife so he can love her and vice versa. He takes no pleasure, therefore, God, in a forced allegiance. And to all, he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. Very important. Very important. Freedom of will is necessary for voluntary service. All right. Galatians 6, 7, however, tells us that freedom goes with responsibility. Uh -huh. Freedom is connected to responsibility. And so the Bible says in the book of Galatians 6, verse 7, it says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So freedom of choice, responsibility. You're free to choose to sow to the flesh, but you also must be prepared to reap corruption. Uh -huh. Lucifer in heaven, therefore, in making his choice to sin, was sowing his destiny. Wow. So notice these points. Freedom to exercise choice is like sowing, and it requires responsibility. If you go to the farm, you go to the farm, right? And you plant a seed. You are making a choice. You are choosing to put avocados or apples or corn whatever seed you choose to plant and the thing is about the law is that you cannot reap that which you did not sow so you can only reap what you sow that's the law nature teaches us that it says we can only reap what we sow so if 
if making a choice is sowing, those who sow wise choices will reap blessings. Those who sow unwisely will reap what? Corruption. Death. Destruction. All right? Good. Infinite love now comes in. Patriots and Prophets, chapter 33, paragraph 1. We go back to God. God is love, 1 John 4, 16. Now we're looking at God and we're seeing God is love. His nature, his law is love. So anybody ask you anything about God, tell them plain, God, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 16, God is love. And when it says God is love, it speaks of his nature and his law. It ever has been and it ever will be because God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity whose, whose ways are everlasting, change it not. With him is no what? Variableness, neither shadow of turn. In other words, there's not the slightest degree or, uh, or idea that he will turn, for want of a better word. All right? Every manifestation of creative power is an expression of infinite love. So when God was creating, he was manifesting love. It was motivated, his creation was motivated by love. His work to create you and me and everybody, all the angels, he was manifesting love. What about overcoming sin? What about putting down rebellion? Does God, does he express love? Is this love? Patriarchs and Prophets 33 says, the history of the great conflict between good and evil. From the time it first began in heaven to the final overthrow of rebellion and the total eradication of sin is also a demonstration of God's unchanging love. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see that? So both creation and the eradication of sin, God is manifesting his love. So what some people say, well, God is not love when he's dealing with sin. God is love when he's dealing with sin. He's always love. His nature is love. His law is love. When the Bible says what you sow, you reap, God, that's love. God is saying you have a choice. I give you freedom of choice because I love you. And therefore, when you make a choice, I will respect that choice. So, Testimony Volume 5. Follow me. Page 190. Paragraph 2 says, Listen. When a man plants doubts, he will reap what? Doubts. All right? We just saw that you can only reap what you sow. By rejecting the first light and every following ray, listen, Pharaoh, everybody know Pharaoh, right? Everybody know Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh went from one degree of hardness of heart to another until the cold, dead forms of the firstborn only checked his unbelief and obstinacy for a moment. And then, determined not to yield to God's way, he continued his willful course until overwhelmed by the waters of the Red Sea. His army was drowned. So Pharaoh is a good example of sowing and reaping on earth. We saw what happened to Lucifer in heaven. Now Pharaoh did the same thing on earth. God sent Moses, let my people go. He says, I know not God, neither will I let 
Israel go. He rejected the word of the Lord. He did not only say, I don't know God. He was saying, I don't even want to know God. He refused. We are told that when a man plants doubts, he will reap doubts. He doubted. He rejected the first ray of light and every other ray because Moses went to him over and over with a message from God. But he was moving from one degree of hardness of heart to another. Every time you reject the Spirit of God speaking to your heart, listen, you never know when this might be your last message that you will hear. Wow. God destroys no one. Testimony in volume 5 again, page 120, paragraph 1 says, God destroys no one. Anybody tells you that God is a destroyer, tell them, listen, God destroys no one. Everyone who is destroyed reaps what he has sown. The sinner destroys himself, it says here, by his own impenitence. He's not repentant. He hears the voice of God and he chooses not to repent. He is sowing and he's going to reap destruction. He's sowing impenitence, rejection of the word of God. When a person, therefore, once neglects to heed the invitations, the reproofs, the warnings of the Spirit of God, his conscience becomes seared. And the next time he is admonished, it will be more difficult to yield obedience than before. And thus, with every repetition, conscience is the voice of God, heard amid the conflict of human passions. And when it is resisted, the Spirit of God is grieved. When your conscience tells you to obey God and you say no I will not you are resisting you are sowing a choice to resist God your choice your seed will bear fruit later look at the destructive nature in sin I'm going to EP 319, paragraph 1 and 2. This one says, speaking of Balaam and Judas, those are two examples. Two examples of rejection of light. Listen. Both Balaam and Judas received great light. Both Balaam, remember Balaam, and Judas who deceived who betrayed Christ, received great light. But a single cherry sin poisoned the entire character and caused their destruction. Mind how you cherish one sin. One cherry sin will little by little debase the character. The indulgence of one evil habit. Watch your evil habits. Does what? It breaks down the defenses of the soul and opens the way for Satan to lead us astray. Because we are compromising. We don't want to give it up. The only safe course, therefore, is to pray as the David. Remember David's prayer? He says, Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. So, Lord, help me. Help me. I need to stop this thing. Give me grace for it. Give me grace. And so we're told, come back to Testimony Volume 5. It says, we want all to understand how the soul is destroyed. Listen 
carefully. It is not that God sends out a decree that man shall not be saved, but man at first resists a motion of the Spirit of God. And having once resisted, it is less difficult to do so the second time, less the third, and far less the fourth. Then comes the harvest to be reaped from the seed of unbelief and resistance. So, wow, is that clear? Praise the Lord. So this is how a soul is destroyed. You reject the mercy of God and you are sowing resistance and unbelief. So we have sown a reaping today. And I want you to listen to me in paragraph 3 of the same book that says, listen, this is how we sow today. We get too busy, right? We get too busy. It says, when secret prayer and reading of the scriptures are neglected today, tomorrow we neglect again. They can be omitted with less remonstrance of conscience. Conscience is saying, do not go out without studying the word. Do not go out without prayer. And you neglect that. And you ignore. And tomorrow you can do it much easier. And the next day much easier. And after a while, you can just run. You have no time for God. And no time for prayer. On the other hand, however... Every ray of light cherished, you can, you can sow in, um, to the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Every ray of light cherished will yield a harvest of light. You're sowing to the Spirit. Temptation once resisted will give power to more fully and firmly resist the second time. Every new victory that you gain over self will smooth the way for higher and nobler triumphs. Each victory is a seed sown to eternal life. So you can sow to life or to death. God wants you and I to sow to life. He wants you to have life everlasting. And that's why he sent Jesus to die and to, to make you to see, he wants you to see his love, to demonstrate infinite love on Calvary. And when you see that love and you believe in Jesus, the Bible says, God sent his son into the world for what purpose, remember? That all who believe in him shall not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. That is the reason why Jesus came. So we come back to Lucifer as we begin our own conclusions. Listen, Great Controversy 494 paragraph 2 says, Lucifer allowed jealousy. In other words, Lucifer allowed negative thoughts to enter a mind that was made perfect. Angelic perfection in heaven failed. Jealousy of Christ. He saw Christ and thought he was looking at an angel. And he said, That's, I need, I'm supposed to be above him. And he argued and rejected what the father was saying concerning his son. So he allowed jealousy of Christ to prevail in his mind. And he became the more determined, we are told. Pride, great controversy 495, in his own glory, nourished the desire for supremacy. He said, I'm too good. I'm better than them. I need to be first. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that he said, I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I'm going to be like the most high. Patriots and prophets, page 42, paragraph 3 says, even when he was cast out of heaven, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan, so God was dealing with the rebellion in love. 
He sinned in heaven. He came, he came to this earth, cast to the earth, and he still was not destroyed. In other words, God was allowing his own son to bring wreaking. Anytime Lucifer is destroyed, it is the result of what he himself has said. Same goes for all of us. Since only the service of love, remember we talk about the service that God can accept. The only service that God can accept is the service of love. And since the only service that of love, only the service of love, sorry, can be acceptable to God, the allegiance of his creatures must rest upon a conviction. I must be convicted of God's justice and benevolence. I must know that he is a loving person. Had he been immediately blotted out of existence, that is Lucifer, some would have served God from fear rather than from love. And God doesn't want anybody serving him from fear. So God says, leave Lucifer alone. Lucifer's soil will bring its own weakness. Sin itself is destructive. Sin itself. God doesn't have to destroy anybody. You choose sin, it will destroy you. You start to eat barbecue ribs and all sorts of evils, it will bring cancer. And all sorts of things in your body. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is what? Death. And that's eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life, the opposite of eternal death. Through Jesus Christ. Our oh Lord, sin begins in the heart and it destroys from within. Love, on the other hand, takes root. Where? In the heart. But it sanctifies the whole being. Wow. Praise the Lord. The lesson of sin, therefore, we have in Peter and Prophets. Stay with me a little bit here. 42, paragraph 4 says, Satan's rebellion, therefore, was to be a lesson to the universe, not only earth, through all coming ages. A perpetual testimony to the nature of sin and its terrible results. The working out of Satan's rule, its effect upon both men and angels, would show what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. Do not set aside the divine authority in your life. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed on this earth. Adam was made perfect. Perfection cannot save you from sin. It is only Bringing yourself, submitting to the authority of God that can save us eternally. Praise the Lord. Amen? So why was sin permitted? Question, as we close, as we begin to wind down. Listen. So let us answer the question as we close. Listen. Once freedom of choice is granted to creatures, infinite love will find a way to deal with it in love. Praise the Lord. See how good God is? So we are told in these verses as we look at these thoughts as we close. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought. So God was loving all the time. He did not wait till the thing happened. You know, sometimes we like to wait until something happened and then we run to fix it. That's not God. We are told the plan for our redemption. Since God, since God knows the end from the beginning, it was not an afterthought. It was not a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. No. It was a revelation of the mystery which had been kept in silence through times eternal. In other words, it was always in God's mind because God knows the end from the beginning. And way back then, God knew that once I give freedom of choice, sin can come in. 
So it was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's truth. So here was the unfolding of love. God says, I can do nothing else but love. But I know how to love. God's love is genuine. It is not fake love. It is genuine. When he says, I give you freedom, choose what you want, I will respect it, he means that. But freedom goes with responsibility. So God's foreknowledge, we are told, from the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. Listen now. God did not ordain, listen, that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision he provided to meet the terrible emergency. So he had a plan and he just put it in place when sin occurred. We are told so great was his love for the world. So we dealing with rebellion, God was dealing in love. So great, that's a measure of God's love. That he covenanted, he said, I will give my son to die when sin occurred. Did he do that? The Bible says in the book of Galatians 4, verse 4, it says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Wow. He covenanted to give his son, his only begotten son, that whosoever, anybody, believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But the gift of Christ did what? It reveals the Father's heart. When you say gift, it should tell you how the person loves you. And we measure that by how big the gift is, how expensive it is, or how small. Somebody gives you a gift, and from the gift you tend to see what is in their heart, how much they love you. And that is what God showed in Christ. The gift of Christ reveals the Father's heart. It testifies that the thoughts of God towards us are thoughts of peace and not of evil. It declares that while God's hatred of sin is as strong as death, his love for the sinner is stronger than death. Oh, praise the Lord. He loves me more stronger than death. So, Patriots and Prophets again, as we, as we bind down, as we bind down, Patriots and Prophets, page 43. I'm looking at paragraph 1. It says, He that ruleth, this is the eternal purpose of love. You see, when God made us, creation was an act of love. And God had every purpose of love in making me. He says, I, you know what I want to bring you to? I want to make you, the, I want to make you so, so beautiful. I want so much for you. So when God created Adam and put him in a garden, he, he made that garden before he created Adam. Everything was majestic and lovely. And you know we talk about the Garden of Eden, right? But you guys don't have a clue how beautiful that was. We see trees today. Those trees are sin damage. The trees in Eden were majestic to look at. It was like looking at art. Somebody draws something beautiful. The Bible says, sorry, Spirit of Prophecy says, He that ruleth in the heavens is the one who sees the end from the beginning. The one before whom the mysteries of the past and the future are alike outspread. And who beyond the woe and darkness and ruin 
that sin has wrought beholds the accomplishment of his own purposes of love and blessing. So God will finish his work that he began when he created me. Sin has caused a pause in God's work of love for me. But when he has eradicated sin and gotten it out of the way, at once I am saved by choosing him, he will perfect me and perfect me. I will grow more and more into the beauty of Jesus. Finally, God's judgment is perfect. We are told, same paragraph, it says, Zo clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgments are the foundation of his throne. He will not do wrong. He will only do right. Listen, people may misunderstand you, but God does not misunderstand anybody. God knows the heart and he knows the circumstance. And he knows when you're right. And people may take away your right, but God will give it back to you. Praise God. You can trust God and you can depend on him. And this, the inhabitants of the universe, we are told, both loyal and disloyal, will one day understand. There are those who are disloyal, but they're going to understand one day that God is fair. God is righteous. He's a God of judgment. And finally, his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. In other words, he judges fairly. He doesn't take away your right and give to somebody else. He's a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So you, that is the God that sent his son on Calvary. He says, I will die for the sinner. The sinner will not die for himself. Praise the Lord. I will restore. He saw that Satan tempted Adam. And he says, therefore, I will die for the race. He saw all that happens in your life. He sees all that is happening right now. And he's saying, don't worry about it. Give it to me. I will set everything in order. Judgment is a habitation of a strong. I urge you to trust God today. Sin was permitted in love. Amen? God bless you. Let us pray. And so, our Father and God in heaven, we thank you for speaking. When we look at the cross and we see Christ, you give us a greater glimpse of your love. But we understand that love to a degree more even today because of what we have studied. We see, Lord, is that you understood what took place in Eden and you was writing that wrong on Calvary. We can trust your wise judgment and we can trust you to vindicate us when we are mistreated and when our rights are taken away. Because your word tells us that judgment and righteousness are the habitation of your throne. We thank you for this message and we pray, Lord, that it will touch our hearts in such a way that we will see you as we have never seen you before. Have your mercy upon us. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.